clean up them unisons. Um, this comes here. I'm going to move this out of the way. You still hear me okay? Okay, this comes from actually a couple of videos that I watched over the weekend of other people trying to teach piano tuning. And, and I thought they did a good job, but every one of them was reiterating. And I think they did it really well. They just, the unisons are key. And a lot of people just don't kind of hold that. And so what I'd like to do is one, impress on you all, which I think we've done in the past, which is how important the unisons are. And then a couple other things that in watching those videos, it, I kind of was reminded of, of some of the some of the things that my mentor would do to help me hear the unisons and whether or not they were pure and, and right where they needed to be. So unlike octaves, where there's can be a slight roll, you know, uh, unisons are just boom. We want them absolutely pure. And today I actually did a handful of tunings and one of them was a spinet and the other was a Boston upright, both the spinet and the Boston upright. There was no matter what I did, I could not make those unisons perfectly pure in the high treble because they had some false beats in there. So whatever you do in, I'm going to be showing you some kind of exercises to do, but do make sure that the piano you're tuning, or at least the section that you're tuning, that those strings are ringing out a hundred percent pure. So in, like for instance, in this case, I've kind of been playing with middle C on this piano as well as um, uh, uh, E3. So those are both, that's a, that's a bichord and then a trichord. And I tested them out. I'm like, oh, okay. I know that these strings are perfectly pure. If I single them out and just listen to them individually, I know that they're just right where they need to be. So do make sure that whatever piano you're going to test this on, you're doing that. So I'd like to first... I'm going to use you as guinea pigs, which is, you know, this is what I do half the time. I want to see how much this is, this microphone right here is picking up. And by the way, when I was doing these tunings, it was again, uh, two sit downs and a standing. So again, I was at a spinet. So sure enough, I was like, no, I do like sitting. I was sitting at the spinet. The console was about yay high. I did stand and I, I did notice about halfway through, I'm like, my back is starting to feel a little, you know, intense. And I did realize that I wasn't even following my own protocol. I wasn't lowering myself. I was leaning over way too much. And then again, the final one was a Steinway Grand. So I sat down with that one. So again, stick to the protocol because even I was drifting off of it and was feeling it in my body, especially with that upright. But right here, let's just start with this bichord. So that's E3. And what I'm going to do, and one of the things that you all can do is how do I know it's pure? What does pure sound like? So first thing you can do is just mute off one string, just so that you're only listening to one string. I don't know if you all can hear it. That is per Can you hear it? It's just perfect. It's not doing anything, you know? And again, that's one string. So guess what? The everything that comes after that needs to follow that perfect line. So that's one thing you can do to train your ear is just be like, okay, I'm not gonna listen to two strings at a time. I'm just gonna listen to one string. So when you're doing the, uh, the unison, it needs to match to be at least, it needs to be that. Just there's there's really no other way around it. It needs to be that pure. As pure as the one string, the two strings need to match and be that pure. So there's one thing to keep in mind is just as you're as you're training yourself is just simplify it and get used to just muting off one of those strings and and listening for it. Now that being said, I'm gonna all right, I'm gonna lower this one. Can you hear that? Yeah, I think so. So we have that versus. Can you 
hear that okay on the mic? Yeah. Yes. So we have the one, just the isolated string. It just goes perfect in a straight line, just perfection. And then I just broke the unison down flat. So that is I lowered the second string. So now what we have is this one string going perfectly and the other kind of the sound wave that goes about like that. And so what you need to do again with unison is simply That's pretty good right there where I just put it. Now the way you can test that, and this was a really, this was that memory coming back is like, oh yeah, I forgot. My mentor would tell me to do that. And that is simply play that note now that you think you've gotten it, right? You've gotten your guide note, which was that left string, and you've matched your the next string to it. What you can do is, remember how we were talking about how that tuning pin is actually fairly flexible? I want you to practice slowly moving that tuning pin, not moving it in the pin block, but twisting it back and forth. So what you're gonna do is go through and say you have it where you think you got it good. You think that your unison is just pure. You're gonna take it. And you're literally able to manipulate, you're able to twist that tuning pin without moving it. And you'll be able to see if I twist it ever so slightly flat or sharp, does it get better? Does it get better or does it get worse? Does that make sense? So you're, you've, you've, you've moved it to the, what you think is the proper position. You need to now test it by simply moving that tuning pin, which is basically just twisting it uh, sharp and flat to see if you like one or the other better than where you have it. And that, my friends, is an important step in really knowing what the unison should sound like. And that just takes a little bit of practice because once you have it, you really have it. You're like, okay, this is what pure is. What I've done, I think is pure, and I'm gonna manipulate it to see if sure enough it is. So I'm gonna give you an example. So it's flat. So this would be one that early on I would say, ah, it's pretty good. I can hear it now, but I'm like, ah. But what I'm gonna do is, So as I'm pushing it flatter, I can tell it's getting even worse. So I know that I don't want to go flatter. And as I pull it sharp, I hear it get even better than what I put it at. So I know I need to reset and go sharp and then ease it back. And then that was better. So again, I was able to figure out, wait a second, I thought it was good. But as I, as I twisted it sharp a little bit, it got even better. So boom, that means I need to break the tuning pin, move it sharp, and then ease it flat again and set it in place. Yeah. Questions about that? I know that's a kind of a weird thing, and I, I doubt anybody has really been told that. Victor, for your mentor, have you ever heard that? Uh, no, he's never told us, but Ram kind of figured that out on his own. Uh, he had told me... Uh, he had shown that to me once. He's like, yeah, it's kind of a way to test it to see if you were, if that's where you want it. And yeah, just to try to bend it and to see if it's actually changing or not. Yeah, that's David, exactly. my, the person I worked with a couple of weeks ago when we were working on, you know, setting the pin and, and that work, he, he showed me that technique uh, you know, because you want to get the pin set in the right place and then you can mm -hmm. slightly tweak it in that method that you just discussed to to fine tune it yeah yeah it's it's one that i i think some of the the people that have come before us like that older generation that were it is something that they used and talked about but i don't think a lot of the modern generation of technicians are doing that as much and so we definitely want to kind of use that as one of the tools in our arsenal of in learning because it really does help 
And especially early on, because what I was struggling with early on is knowing whether or not the notes were as good as I could get them or not. And th and I think that part of me was like, oh, I think it's as good as it's going to get, so it's going to be good. And it wasn't until my mentor was like, eh, try this. And then it was like, shoot, back to the drawing board. I can hear it. They're not as good, so I need to go ahead. And usually what would happen is my tunings would be a little bit too flat, the, the unison. So it would be that I wasn't bringing it sharp enough and easing it back. It usually was borderline right where it needed to be or a little bit flat. And so that was an exercise that I did over a while that really helped cement, okay, here's here's what I need to be listening for and, and doing that. Again, before you get really frustrated, make sure that your piano and the notes themselves are actually pure because I can't tell you how many times um, I've, I've talked to technicians and they'll be so discouraged because they're just not getting it. They're not getting it. And, and finally, when I, I, I bring into the office, bring them into the shop and say, hey, try it on this. They're like, I can hear it. I get it. It makes sense to come to find out that the piano that they're working on every day is just has is riddled with false beats to where it will. They're just driving themselves crazy. They can't do anything about that. And so um, to give you some um, some advice of what I did today, because, again, I had two of those panels today had a lot of false beats. Um, you know, roughly C6, C7, right around there, it was, it was just full of them. And so what I had to do is I would just basically tune every one to the device, my ETD, each one of those three strings because it was so bad. Because, again, I would try one side, then try the other. I'm like, no. So then I would just try to tune them each to the device, see if that worked. And if that didn't, then I would just kind of manipulate them uh, uh, sharp or flat to get it so that they're at least as little noticeable as possible. Because sometimes that's that's what you have to do is just blend them in a different way to where you're like, I know that I'm close tuning wise as, as far as to perfect pitch, but I'm, I'm manipulating it quite a bit. You know, if you've done quite a bit of oral tuning, this is this is nothing new. You know, Victor Ramses, you guys have been doing a lot of oral tuning. So it's just sometimes when you're getting used to the ETD, I don't know if you've done that yet, Victor, with your new device, if, if you've tested that out, but it's it goes pretty quick if you do it that way. I have a question, David. Yeah. How would you describe physically easing it back from sharp? Mm -hmm. You know, we talked about the amount of pressure kind of clicking it up. But when you yeah. get it sharp, what's your approximate sense? Five, ten cents sharp? Mm. When you ease it back, what does that feel like? How does that differ from uh, clicking it up? You know, that's a good question. And I, I, let's, let's actually test it together. I'll go get my ETD really quick because I'm actually a little curious. If I had to guess, it's maybe one cent or maybe half a cent. But I'm going to go grab my ETD really quick. Stacy, you can tell a joke joke um nope. no pressure yeah okay oh i wish i could share a picture um yeah. there was a picture i saw on the forums today and the guy was asked to tune a piano and it was like a, a room full of dolls like dolls like the porcelain kind and i don't know if you guys grew up like i did but i grew up watching the twilight zone and there was this <laughs> episode called talkie tina and it terrified me i remember four years old watching it Anyway, he like even the guy was like all the dolls were like staring at him. I'll sh I'll share it on the forum. It's like so creepy. <laughs> what it's are you talking about? A room full of dolls. <laughs> like 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 I'm talking hundreds. Anyway, that's not really a joke, but that's all I can. <laughs> I love it. One, two, three. So we're at we're at uh, C3. So what I'm gonna do is is I'm gonna tune E3 to my device. And, and and just, I'm gonna tune the far left string to it. So this is E3. As you can see, let's do this. Come on.
it's like right there, right? In fact, I'm going to do uh, switch this over from I'm going to switch this over from Smart Tune over to Fine Tune, just so that we can. I don't know. I'm like I like the yellowy mustardy color better. I don't know. That's just me. Yeah. So we're right there. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to lower quite a bit the neighboring note, you know, the string. So there's that. Oh, I did it. I did it too quick. Okay. So I'm going to bring it sharp to my right way. So I'm that. So that's probably three cents right there. Did you see that, Robert? Um, so basically, I kind of went between one and three cents if I had to guess. So I'm going to try it one more time. So I'm looking at this E3 perfectly. I'm going to get it just right so that that is not moving at all. So great. The far left string is set right there. Now I'm going to go ahead and lower the next note. Yep, right there. Okay, so then now let's just look at it. Sure enough. That was about that three cents just again, right there. Now, I don't know if it would be different on a different piano, but I will... Uh, I'm doing a piano tomorrow, Robert, so I will test it out because I, I, if I had to guess, I would have said, no way am I doing it three cents. I would have been like maybe a cent or half a cent, but it is a fair amount. Because David, that's I, interesting I, that you, you are going up to about three cents because when I was tuning today, I was, mm -hmm. you know, on the pens that I thought I set the best, I was going about four or five. Okay. And then bringing it down. And that seemed yeah. to be my most successful for me on that piano. Yeah, I would say I'm between three and five. Holy cow. Yeah, maybe next time we we talk. Victor, are you doing another tuning between now and, and, and Wednesday? Uh, yeah, I can. Yeah, I can, I'll take yeah. the one here with Alice. Yeah, maybe maybe let me know and and, and see for the same because ah, that's crazy that it is between probably three and five cents and then I'm easing it to where it needs to be. I if I'm not, the, yeah. Uh, go ahead, go ahead. No, go for it. Uh, I feel like in the high treble, I definitely pull pretty high. Um, mm -hmm. I'm doing a couple clicks up. Uh, I'm sure that. And then pounding it down. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I like I'm pulling really high on the high treble, really going past, and then coming back down. Um, yeah, like it sounds like you're going to like almost the next note, but then yeah. you let go and kind of ease down, you're there. And the ones that I don't do that, usually they're not as stable. Okay, so here, let's try this. Let's go ahead, and I'm going to try to just barely do it sharp, maybe at one cent, and see what that does. Robert, I love these questions. You're pushing me. You're pushing me. Okay, so we got that three. Great. So here we go. I'll wait for the phone to stop because that's going to bug. Someday we'll have an office that we are not getting calls. I don't know. I don't know if I want that. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and tune this. To me, I'm gonna to try to go like one cent sharp and then and then see how that goes. So here we go. Okay. So that's about it's about a cent or two. flat I'm already too flat now that I moved it down that's crazy so one to two cents you're moving it down you're you're easing it down more than that that's crazy okay okay 
so I'm curious, as everybody does their homework, <laughs> if if everybody is around that three to five cent sharp, then easing it down to where it needs to be. And um, because, yeah, as I did one to two cents, as I eased it, it, it was it, it went too flat. It went too flat. And so um, and I, I didn't think it was going to be very stable. So that is a good I'm going to I'm going to play around with that a little bit on tomorrow, Tuesday. On Wednesday, we're going to be doing a little bit of a different thing than what we have planned, which was going to be the upright teardown. And instead, we're actually going to do a stress test. And so I'm going to show you using the RPT issued or PTG issued thumper pounder what the expectation is as far as what your piano tuning needs to hold up to as far as the amount of pressure. And I'll try to simulate with, you know, we'll try to test this out and then simulate it. Hey, it needs to be able to hold up to at least this. And so go ahead and stress test your, your unisense, stress test yourself. So we're going to do that on Wednesday, but between now and Wednesday, I think it would be a good idea to go ahead and see if sure enough, that is a three to five cent sharp over pull and then easing it down to perfect, uh, to, to, to a good uh, sound. So, um, and Robert, you're using the cyber ear as well, right? Yes. My, my thing is sometimes I just ease it and so, suddenly I just oops, I go way flat again. Yep. Just knowing the right amount of pressure. And sometimes it's just a test blow will get it down. So I don't know yeah. the balance between easing it and a test blow. Do you do a test blow first just to see if that will do it? Mm. Usually. Usually if I'm a little bit sharp and I know I'm a little sharp, I kind of like, I think if I pounded it really hard, it'll go a little bit flat and I'll do that. And then I'll test the unison to see if the first string held. And if it did, I'm like, boom, I'm going to leave that. So yeah, I've used aggressive test blows. If one of the strings seems a little bit sharp and tried to pound that, the only thing is you want to make sure you're not overdoing it so that the first string doesn't go out of tune. And I've had that happen before too. But um, yeah, but go ahead and, and try that, Robert, next time with the uh, and uh, with just moving it a little bit left and right, sharp and flat. In this case, as I moved it a little bit flatter, I could tell that that sound sounded even better. So. Now I have a weird wave. And so I might have even right there knocked that first one out. And it's that temperamental at times. I know we've talked about quiet tuning or uh, as far as not pounding. I would have to say you probably don't want to start doing it super light. Because you can work your way down to that. Um, but I do feel after thinking about it more that, you know, really learning how to set it is first and foremost key. And you're going to hear on Wednesday what they're going to test it at. So again, I was pretty surprised. Like I was doing it just earlier today and I was like a couple of my unisons like went out that I wasn't like being that intentional on. I'm like, geez. This is going to be super crazy on Wednesday because I'm going to put it on some of them. It's going to be like, okay, I think I set this unison. I think it's good. Let's whack it. I think they do three times. It's just, it's just like this guillotine. Boom, boom, boom. And so you're going to get to see. And so we could even try it. I'll try to do a super light, gingerly <laughs> set, and we'll see if it, it holds or not. So I think the I actually think the Wednesday is going to be kind of fun, but I'm going to be sweating the bullets a little bit. So, but we'll be able to see uh, what it's like, and then also have you guys replicate that in your own homes to be like, okay, it's about this, you know, it's it's about this pressure. Yeah, because if I had to guess, this is probably three pounds, three to five pounds, and it's going up about four inches. 
that's a bit that's and it's solid brass <laughs> when it arrived i was like geez okay i remember i was scared when you dropped it on your finger that it would like hurt you i know i did that off camera so i already knew it wasn't but I... <laughs> uh but we have time for some questions today because i knew today wasn't going to be taking too much time but michael uh, can you kind of explain the service call you went on? Because I think it's great well, for the whole group. I, I have a question first related to okay. tuning stuff. And the, yeah. this will flow right into the piano I worked on today. So the piano I worked on today, it was right up against the wall. And the, mm -hmm. the right-hand keys, keys, you know, the, the top opti octave was kind of underneath a cabinet. So I couldn't get to the right-hand side to, to do normal. Yeah. And I was having to work left-handed. Could you talk about situations like that where you can't get proper posture where you in your normal stance yeah. and having to do something different? In this case, a grand left-handed, or you might talk about the same thing from an upright st uh, standpoint as well. Totally. So there's usually a couple options. And so for whatever reason, it seems like I've gotten to so many houses where there's a wall right here, right at that trouble. And it's just like, there's a little half wall and then there's a living room over here. So basically you're like, you're, you can't get anything else over here. So you have two options in this case. And I've done usually because I'm not, it's funny because I'm left-handed and I'm super ambidextrous in everything regulation. But when it comes to tuning, it's like my brain doesn't work. I cannot tune with my left. It's weird. So what I've done in the past, just to avoid going left is I have gone like this. I have tuned like this. So I'm up against the wall and I'm kind of going to the side, kind of like over here. And I'm, I'm going here. Because right here, of course, I'm hitting a wall, right? Hitting wall, I can't go that way. So I will go sometimes down crazy low like that. So that would be my first thing on an upright if there's a wall here, just because I'm super not confident in, in my tuning of the uh, left-handed. Now that's not to say like, hey, David doesn't do it, so I don't have to do it. No, try it, like get good at it. I, I mean, I'm, I still try sometimes, I just suck at it. And so it'd be, the, it'd be like this. So again, It feels like so different to me. I don't know what it is. It's so bad. But th those are really the two options that you have. You, you, you get to where you can do the spinal. And that's what I would do. If you have time, if, if you can take this time now as you're getting your customers and stuff like that, try to do the last octave lefty on these uprights. You will not be sorry. Like if I could undo 25 years ago, go like my future now self to be like, dude, Try this. Go left-handed. I'd be like, you're crazy, but I'll do it. And I, I, I'd be so, who even knows where I'd be today if I could do that? Grand pianos. I did this, um, I think it was like a couple weeks ago. So obviously grand piano is going to be down with the four. And so I'm usually moving my bench and I'm, I'm, I'm tuning. But what I've started to do lately And I don't know why, I don't know why, <laughs> but I've gotten to the point where this kind of last octave, it's like, I kind of want to stretch. So what I'll do is again, the bell of the piano is like, excuse me, the curve of the piano goes like this. So I'll kind of stand up and I'll be, you know, I'll be kind of right in here, standing up with it and kind of being around this curve of the piano like that. And there was this particular situation where I kind of needed to do that. I don't remember what it was, but I, I was able to do that and it felt fairly natural. I was kind of tuning right in here and I, again, hugging that, that curve right there and it worked really well. Um, I would try to do the lefty though. I, you're, not, you're not gonna be sorry you did it. And if you can get it, then you will save yourself so much time. I, my, my mentor, who I swear, John, if you're listening to this, I think you dropped me. At one point, because I was like, I couldn't do the left-handed thing. I'm playing with you. 
but he would tune righty, 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 lefty, lefty, lefty. So he would go tune it like this, like normal. And then about here, he would start to tune it to the left. Same with the grand. Just like, okay. And so he was really like, this is the way to go. I don't disagree with him. I just couldn't do it. Just couldn't do it. So what did you end up doing? Uh, I kind of tried to do it left and then I tried to just squeeze it in. Actually, yeah. I worked with the customer. I'm going to go back and, and do the high treble because it was so far out. It was about 30 to 40 cents out across the board. Oh, wow. So, you know, I pulled everything up to pitch. And other than like the t top octave, we're octave yeah. and a half. And so I'm going to go back in about three or four weeks cause, and, and finish the top octave as okay. well as see how the the overall piano is holding as well. Because, yeah. you know, it, it was all over the place. It sounded oh, horrible. 40 I, cents, I, did not, 50 cents. I did not take, I should have taken a video of how bad it sounded, I, but I, I didn't do that. I should have. <laughs> Um, That'd but, be fun to post on our feed, the before and afters of our tunings, just a quick little. <laughs> so here is the piano that I got to work on. Oh, yeah. So this is a, a Wurlitzer um, Baby Grand um, uh, built in around 1990-ish time frame. Okay. I so don't know. No, I couldn't are. find the serial number. So I don't know whether you have any suggestions because there wasn't, you know, a lot of times they put the serial number here in the, the little triangle, which it wasn't mm -hmm. there, but I didn't see it anywhere else. So I'm not too sure where it was hiding. So uh, on that note, just so you all know, a lot of times the serial numbers will be on the uh, uh, key uh, uh, the key frame. You would remove the key slip. And then you will see a five to seven to eight, you know, uh, uh, numbers on the key frame itself. Okay. And so that's a lot of times where I'll go to if it's not visible like that. I'll have to take a look next time in there. And because it wasn't that hard to, you know, it had two screws, you know, one on each cheek block. You pop the cheek blocks out and then the key slip could be removed because the or the key slip could be removed because the cheek blocks had a little notch in it that kept the key slip in place. So you had to do it in that order, which was kind of interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. So how did these this customer, they, they found you online. Is right. that what happened? Called you. They yep. said what? They said in the, in the request that the um, piano hadn't been tuned probably since about 2010. It's been recently moved. And okay. that the uh, about a, a twelve or so keys are stuck, so that's that's what knowledge I had going into it. Okay, he, I get to the customer, very very fun lady. I go to sit down at the piano. You know, she gave me the basically the same spiel that I just told yeah. you again. Repeated it. This is what I got to look at. <laughs> basically, from um, um, G four all the way up to you know past um c5 almost up to to f5 it was basically everything was stuck so i removed the case parts this is what you got to look at underneath and um as far as discussion on friday yeah everything shifted in movement when they had it tipped on its side it took me a little bit i actually because it it didn't want to um, shift when I tried to just move the keys without, I ended up removing the action out, setting yeah. it on, I had a little folding table with me. That way I had a better, better visibility as I was moving the keys around. But sure. eventually I was able to loosen everything up, get everything um, back on the key, uh, on the, on the pins, on the front rail pins. Everything was smooth after that. When you can do this so effortlessly, I mean, there did require some effort, but I'm sure that the, that the customer was a little bit nervous. Like what happened to my piano? Yeah. 
Yeah, and one of the first things, you know, I said even before I took it apart, I said, here's probably what happened. And so I said, it yeah. probably just shifted in movement, you know, you know, when it was being moved, it shouldn't be a, that big of a deal to get it back to, back to normal. And it, and it wasn't. It was wow. actually not that bad. I was hoping that I'd be able to do it with it in the piano, which yeah. unfortunately I, I wasn't able to because I, I didn't want to force anything. So I decided to pull it out. But yeah. I was, I was very happy with the results and oh, oh my it, goodness. Looked, it looked really good. Was How did because... you get that action out with it right against the wall like that? And the ship well, there out? was enough room for me good to question. slip out, you know, and as you pulled the action out, you um, just before the hammers cleared the, the board, I was able to tip the action like you had okay. um, described in, yep. in previously, where you bring it out, you tip it up, so that you clear the hammers and then I was able to grab on the side of the, the frame, lift it up and pull it up toward me. And then I was able to clear the piano and then move it mm -hmm. out. So I was able to back up far enough because there's a wall. Essentially, yeah. if you're sitting down, there's a little L wall. You have the wall on the right and a wall right behind you. But there was enough room to remove the action. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I was a little bit nervous um, because I didn't mention that sometimes those hammers will be up. So be very careful as you pull that action. Well, I had reread and, and relooked at materials previously from my training <laughs> that I've gone through. So, yeah, I, I was aware of that and I remembered it. So I didn't, you know, making sure the hammers cleared and not catch and break a hammer or anything. Like yeah. That. Okay. Wow, but yeah, yeah, it went really smooth. I was very happy that that was successful, and you know it. And you got a five star review, and I got a five star review out of it, so I, I was very pleased. And um, yeah, for awesome. you know a piano that hadn't been tuned for you know twenty plus years, yeah, you know, or fourteen years, I guess. Um, it actually, you know. I think after it, cause I did a, a, cor a, a course pass, just, I just as quick as I could went through the piano just to bring it up closer to pitch. Yeah. And then I started going back and did a, a more of a fine tuning on a second pass, but I did just pass up on, on like that top octave, octave and a half. How long were you at, you know, from, from opening up the door to closing the door, how long would you say you're in the customer's house? Four hours. So one hour right. for the repair and okay. three three hours for the tuning. And I also did um, a basic cleaning of the keys, basic cleaning of the case and the plate. Um, and then, um, you know, a couple of breaks in between, you know, Perfect. about half, halfway through, I took a, a short break. How did you feel going into the service call versus coming out of it? Um, because we had had the discussion on, on the, the, the repair part, I felt pretty good. I just was hoping I didn't run into something I didn't, yeah. that it was too big, which it wasn't luckily. So I was actually, you know, fairly confident going in and very pleased coming out that, you know, how everything went. So. Yeah. Oh, just that it's such a big step if going to, and, and your first chart, you know, I'm guessing you charged for this yep. one. Yep. yep. So you're actually charging for your service. You're officially a professional piano technician. You know, it's such a big thing, and you get a and you get a review. That's that's pretty massive. So yeah. it's it's not a little thing. It's a big deal. So congratulations. Yeah. There's um, one other photo. Let me uh, share this with you. Let me change. Let me change screens here. And by the way, Michael went ahead and because he knew this was coming up, he wasn't quite sure. Was able to kind of private message us and be like, hey. This is kind of what I'm I'm going to be coming up against. Do you have any thoughts? Stuff like that. So again, that's a resource that you all kind of have. So utilize that if you want, because it's 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 just having another set of eyes on it. Yeah. So here's what it looked like. If you can, can you see my screen? Um, yeah. Yeah, we can see see it. yeah. Yeah. So here's what it looked like afterwards. So we had the before with things looking like yep. a rainbow, and now everything's straight. So. Oh, that's so good. And by the way, when you do this, if you all run into this, be sure to lift the keys and drop them into place. As I've done this before where I'm like, oh, I can fix this. And I scooted them. And what it ended up doing is dislodging the key bushings. 
because again, they fold over the tabs, they fold over and are secure by, by pulling them across that, that uh, uh, front rail pin. I basically just like got them dislodged and then I had to go and re-glue like three or four of them. So lift and set them into place. All the things, all the things, all the little repairs you can make for yourself. <laughs> so that was my successful day today. That's right. That was today. Good job. Um, I have a question, David. Yeah. Would you describe false beats, especially in the upper register? I bought this little thing from Shaft, this little tool. I'm not, I'm not really sure how you use it. <laughs> Yeah, it's a false meat detector. Do you use this? In... I've never a little used groove that. here. Yeah, um, basically what you do is you, you kind of use that and, and travel the string with it to try to kind of straighten it is the theory. Now, I've never used that. I've I've heard of people using that. And I've also heard uh, Mark Perney speak um, speak well of the tool that he uses that kind of goes around the um the bridge pin. yeah the bridge yeah, pin yeah bridge i've got one of those when yeah. i re restrung something it kind of stretches the gap between the pins but I, i'm just curious on false beats in the upper register because if i have anything that's a little tricky for me to hear is yeah. some of the upper registers I've just never done a lot with that. <laughs> My go-to has always been doing a lot of voicing. So that is, if you imagine a harder, harsher hammer is going to accentuate those beats that much more. So what I'll usually tell the customers, like, listen, you have some false beats here. They're kind of riddled throughout. The easiest thing to do would be to go ahead and soften the, 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 the hammer or to make the hammer not... Uh, as bright or as hard and therefore make it so that you're not hearing them as much. So usually customers are like, yes, but actually I'll wind up. Usually the customer doesn't even know. Usually they're like, I, I don't hear anything. So we as technicians will hear anything and everything, but I would say nine out of 10 of the customers, they don't even know that there's a false beat. They just, they're not, they're not focused in that far, but for you and I as technicians, it sure makes it a, hard, a lot harder to tune it. And so I totally get that. I just not have never done a lot to try to rectify that or had success in the things that I've done. I've tapped them on the bridge. You know, I've tried to do some of that, but that hasn't really worked that well. I've not tried Mark Perney Supply 88's tool, but I trust him and I could see that working part of the time or at least some of it. But the reality is how much time is the customer willing to have you spend on something like that is a big one. And as Victor knows, as you go into the customer's house, you have a lot of times all these great expectations of what you would do if this was your piano <laughs> that does not necessarily match up to what the customer is willing to do, have you pay for or have you work in their home to do. So there's not a lot of help. I'm sorry, Robert. <laughs> I, I have seen people put, um, uh, CA glue on the bridge pin if the string is getting false beats. I've seen that work for some people. Really? I've never done it personally. Yeah, there's a video on YouTube, I think from the PTG's YouTube channel, and they're talking about that false beats and how sometimes it can be coming from that bridge pin termination right there. Well, um, describe I mean, how, never tried it. what exactly is a false beat? How do you know it's a false beat and not a real out of tune beat? I can hear out of tune. But how do I know? Am I listening to a false beat yeah. or am so I that, listening to an out of tune? No. Well, it won't be out of tune with itself if it's one string. That's the big giveaway. Right. You, I, a, a single string. So that's why if I'm like, man, I'm not able to get this, to, this, you know, usually it'll be the second or third string, right? Because you're using your ETD to do the first string. You're like, no, that sounds pure. I hear that. I got, I locked it in. And then you go to get the middle string tuned to the left. And you're like, man, I just can't. And sure enough, then you're like, maybe there's something wrong with this middle string. So you'll go ahead and mute the left string, the right string, so that you're only listening to that one middle string. And you'll hear, wah, 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 wah. And you're like, shoot. So then what you do, and this is one technique to disguise false beats, is 
you listening to that beat will say it's like let's just say it sounds like this wah 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 you know that no matter what when you're tuning it to the first string you want it to not get any worse than that one sound wah 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 because what happens is when you get to starting it you're going to be, hear multiple sounds because not only is it the out of tuneness, but then also the imperfection in the string itself. So you want to get it to at least baseline to just that wah, 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 wah. Okay. I, I'm sorry. I was just ignorant on that. So a fully false beat is one string vibrato. Yes. Essentially. Yes. Okay. It's there's either an imperfection in the string itself. There's something going on in, in the termination point of it, you know, the, the, the speaking length. There could be some piece of rust on it that's creating something weird, or it could just not be seated properly. It could be, or there's an issue with the manufacturing of the string. I've had new, brand new Busendorfers with this. So it could also be the piano, right? If it's vibrating at a certain frequency, the piano totally. vibrates. Totally. Totally. It could be all of these things. And usually it's not just one easy fix, which is why I usually don't go down that rabbit hole just because it could be so many things. But usually you're, what happens is usually you say, okay, there's one out of three strings that has this false beat. Wah, 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 wah. No matter what, this unison will only be as pure as that. Wah, 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 wah. So that's what you're shooting for is getting it at least that. David, you said you, you've seen it on brand new pianos, but typically you, you see this on older pianos, right? That have had some age to them and they've either collected the rust or other situations have happened to them, correct? That, that's right. And for whatever reason, I've noticed it more on upright pianos than grands. I don't know why that is, but I've just, I've just noticed that. And I don't know why. And it could just be, it just could be something that I've noticed and that's not typical. But um, yeah, because it's just based on the sample set, I guess you've got yeah. the, the ones that have been uprights and not so much grands. So. Yeah, I'm not sure what it is, but yeah, I've had brand new pianos where they'll have just a little bit of that false beat, and that's that's a real bummer when you're working for on behalf of a dealer that sold the piano that there's a false beat in there and they just spent hundred and fifty thousand dollars and there's this sound in there that they don't like. No, it's not great. So, do you get to the point where you just change the string? I've done that, um, and and that's worked sometimes. But it's really a bummer when you've done that and then it's still there. It's just like, okay, I don't even know. I don't even know. And I'm sure there's greater minds than me that would be like, well, you talk, you do these five things, and it'll be solved. I've never met somebody who said that, but I'm sure that they're out there. <laughs> Stacey, you've worked in the retail field. Have you come across that very much where you have brand new pianos that have those false beats? Can't hear you. Sorry, sorry, I forgot to unmute. Um, I have heard that before. I've actually heard it before and I was like, I can hear that. Oh, <laughs> um, but, but I don't know what, I, I should have paid more attention, I guess. I, would, I, didn't, I don't know how they fixed it, but they were able to. Yeah. I don't think they replace strings. I'm I don't know, but I have heard it before. It's really interesting. I don't know. That's yeah. my I know I'm a ton. No, and it's super frustrating. <laughs> Luckily, in my experience, it's mostly been once you get to that upper treble, it's it's mostly in this section. Um, and so I've, I've not really noticed it in the bass or the treble being or uh, the, the that mid section it being a deal. So luckily in the main spot pop spot where people are playing it doesn't seem to be an issue that is really holding people back but it is frustrating as technicians because usually we're like man my tuning is stellar and then all of a sudden you hit that point and that happened to me with this boston today it was just like Ugh. i'm like oh i guess it's only going to be this good the tuning and customer was happy it was a church and oh well oh well But yeah, it's just one string, Robert, and it's usually not like there. It's usually one string per tricord. It's it's not it's not usually all three or two. It's usually just one of the three. And it's not like you'll get into a section of like shoot all all of these notes one of the strings. It's usually one one here and there. It's weird. It's weird. So just tell them your piano is an opera singer. They're using a little vibrato. 
Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. This is such a special piano that this string wants to really have this vibrato. Congratulations. <laughs> I'll say we definitely find that, yeah, an upper, we hear more in uprights. Yeah. Yeah. And, and especially like Yamaha uprights, I feel a lot of false beats in the higher register of Yamahas compared to like Kawhi's or something. Or interesting. That is interesting. Yeah. Do you ever get to a point where you mute off? Sorry. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, John. Oh, I was asking if, if you ever get to a point where you mute off uh, one of those third strings just to cut it out. I have. That's a good question. I have, in fact, what I've had to do is, um, yes, I've, I've had to mute off because it was just so bad. It was like, there was something there. It was just like this chunky, as best I could describe it, it was like this weird chunky wave to it. And I'm like, this is horrible. And sure enough, so, and that's what I did is I, I clipped off some of my rubber mute, felt mute, wedged it in there between, you know, the, the strings and, and it was good. Luckily, I think when I did that, it was the far left string. And so what I did is I just muted that far left string and then the far right string of the, you know, unit, you know, tri chords before that. So it worked out okay. Customer, I, I let them know. And they were like, yeah, I can't hear a difference. So they're like, good. Because usually if you have two of those three strings, you're still pretty set. So much of what we do is, is not ideal what we would think of as ideal. It's like, man, ideally, yes, it wouldn't have this issue. I could fix this, I could fix it properly. But most of what we do is, is I've used this term before, it's like jazz, we're, 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 we're working with what we got, we're, we're on our toes, we're trying to figure out solutions. To be honest, I think that's one of the fun things we get to do as, as professionals that go out in the field you know, I have respect for, for you know, shop technicians, you know, store technicians, but it's not the same. The, the stakes aren't there. The pressure isn't there. The, you, you have to be on your A game. Usually field technicians will get paid more because of that. Because not only do you have to be able to work on your, you know, be on your toes and figure out solutions, you have to do that all while you have a customer that maybe is difficult to work with. And so the pre personal skills as well as the technician technical skills just sets you as field technicians as a level above. And so. Yeah. One thing I find interesting is that every piano you go to, how you open a cabinet of a piano is slightly different with every single piano. So yeah. if you've not worked on that particular model, it could be different. And yeah. you know, that's what I find interesting is that, you know, I've, I've only gotten to work on a couple of different grands so far, but I've worked on quite a few different uprights, mm -hmm. but every single upright to get that, you know, you know, every lid slightly different, you know, cause I've had a, a, a Baldwin Hamilton that the yeah. thing is all that huge hinge all the way up. So I've had one of those, you know, I've had my old, my yes, old style. Justin. Yes. Does that want, does that have a kickstand above it, Justin? So that would be. Did you, did you do it? Yeah. Right there. Yes. There you go. Did you all know that? I was tuning for probably 15 years before a technician showed me that. And I would just have my little, my little uh, lid prop and it would be usually like shaking. And they're like, dude, and they yeah. like folded that down. I'm like, I, Oh my gosh. I bought my, my 30 inch dowel rod. <laughs> Three quarter inch dial, dial rod, so I'll have that in a, now for any for anyone oh that I, I go to. Yeah. I was so tripped out when I opened this piano. I didn't know that did that. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that crazy? <laughs> I broke an Everett lid. I bent it because the Everett's they have this ridiculous. You have to use an Allen wrench. On I thought it was a hinge. Yeah. Thought, Man, this hinge is not giving. Oh, I realized. Oh, I needed an Allen wrench. Yeah, they open so, from the back. It's, oh, it's ridiculous. It's confusing. <laughs> you make these mistakes once. You do it once. Well, sometimes you do it more than once. But yeah, I, I've done it more than once. <laughs> <laughs> You're allowed one time, so that's okay. <laughs> well, I have to share. I, I changed the string out and... Uh, I thought I was on a roll. I thought, man, 15 minutes, got the second Beckett. Yeah. This is, I looked down. Well, I put the second string on the outside of the V-bar. 
oh. instead of under it. Oops. And, it, and I just subbed the flap. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> but I clipped about an inch off, and I, I got it under there. I thought, I'm not going to totally redo it, but I got it to work. But that was so deflating because I thought, and I thought, I'm an idiot. But, you know, yeah. you learn that once on that. I've done that where I've fed it through the wrong hole of the A graph, and so then they're switched. I've done one where I missed the A graph entirely. I don't even know how I did that. <laughs> Some of the most random, but I think it goes to that thing where you're in a customer's house. There's this, there is more of an intense situation going on. You know, I don't know. My heart goes out for technicians. That's what I've been doing. The field stuff. I've done both. I've done a lot of shop restoration work, and I've done a lot of field work. And I'll I'll say it. Field work's harder. Field work. There's so many more moving. There's so many more moving parts to it, and you have to be able to you navigate that. At the end of the day. You're here in the shop, oh shoot, I just broke that. I'm going to clamp it, glue it, let it sit overnight. No big deal. Nobody saw it. <laughs> you know, in the field, it's not that way. But again, I think that that's part of the intrigue of it. And um, yeah, that's, it's just, I, I love it. I, it's, it's the big leagues, you know, that's what it is. It is. It feels like the big leagues to me. And maybe, maybe someday there'll be some restoration shop technicians watching this and like, ah, you're cracked. That's fine. That's fine. As long as you're working on pianos and loving it, I'm good. I have a question, David. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, About uh, my U1 here at my house, I guess since I, you know, I never worked, practiced tuning on it, but I really haven't done any serious playing. So finally decided to sit down and play and I was like, oh man, it doesn't really feel right. And so it has a mute on it, but I'm noticing that it's letting off real soon. Is that common when there's a mute row in there that they make it let off sooner? It is sooner, but it's not that much. So I would go ahead and I think it's in, I think it's closer to a quarter inch instead of an eighth inch. And yeah. um, I would say it's about that. Is it about that? Yeah. It you yeah. give up something when you get those. It's yeah, just there. No, it's not like, as. I, I don't like it. Yeah. Yeah. And if you do look at it, what year is the U1? Uh, I think it's 2000, somewhere around okay. there. Yeah. So on the left hand side, you should see a sticker and it will actually show you the spec for technicians that they want oh. you to adhere to. So if you next time you go see it, see on the left hand side if there's a sticker. It's usually in black and white and it's a diagram. And I'm always oh, wow. like, oh. yeah, okay, yeah. And also, the I don't know if, if you guys do this, but you know, it, we played it pretty heavily. And so, the middle section, you know, I feel like there's a lot of play in the key bushings, but not really on the outs, you know, on the, in the bass and the treble. Will you just replace the section, or no? Will you just recommend replacing all the key bushings? So I don't know if you can still get it. Michael, you might know this because I thought you said something about it, but they make something called Pro Felt. Have you heard of this? So Pro Felt is a solution. I don't know if they still sell it, but basically you would go ahead and um, it's I'm trying to think if I have some. I don't think I have some, but basically that solution seeps down into the bushings whatever bushings are and it swells the re-swells and invigorates the 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 felt itself to where it it oh. it, it, it it swallow you know uh, it just gets bigger yeah and it swells up the felt that. yeah it swells up the felt and we've used that with great success and so that's especially okay. good yeah. when it's something like this where the mid is a little bit looser than the rest and we just don't, we don't want to replace everything uh, we don't want to pivot the pins. We just want to go ahead and 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 use that treatment. Yeah. So we we do need to figure out if that still is available. We used to get it at Piano Tech and buy it giant bottles. It's called Pro Felt. Yeah. Pro Felt. Okay. I'm sure I can find it. That's and really a little good. bit of like a drop on each bushing is like from a little hypo needle bottle. Just a one little drop on mm-hmm. each side of the bushing, more than enough. Okay. And if, I guess if you go overboard, you can still ease it or. <laughs> yeah. Really you, if you go overboard, what you do is you risk it dislodging that glue joint. And so oh, I did that yeah. once is I like, I'm like, Hey, if a little's good, then a lot is great. And then I come back yeah. the next day and all the bushings <laughs> have like 
folded in on themselves because they got like the glue stopped working. So then I had to read. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I know that yeah. Howard uh, is showing something that's felt restore that is a, a pro felt alternative. Okay. So at a minimum, you can get it there. Yeah, and I trust Howard. Okay. Those guys, awesome. they, they, those guys know what they're doing. So, in just googling awesome. stuff, there is um, an article out there on um, the PTG talking about um, rebushing keys versus using pro felt. So, there are some articles, or you know, actually, this is like a a comment thread in one of the discussion forums. So, yeah. you can read up on that to see. When, when's a good time to use profile versus rebush keys? I would say that this well, is another one. I feel like most things are a hot debate. I don't know if you've recognized that, but it seems like there's a lot of hot debate items. <laughs> so this might be one of them, just so FYI, as you go into it. Oh, yeah. but do, you, uh, do you think, though, I'll run into an issue if I try to get the hammers to let off just a little later or... You, you recommend just leaving it what Yamaha recommends. I would recommend pushing it because you're a player. You know, I, I try to get it to form, perform you're, what you want it to do. You're a technician and you're you're the performer, so yeah. treat it like you're doing a concert um, uh, tuning, and you're you're trying to put the piano to the player's specifications. You're the player. Yep. You want it to a different specification, yeah. so do you get it. to be yeah. a really jerk yeah. of a. Uh, of a customer with high demanding and now you, and you get to work yeah. with yourself. <laughs> yeah, and that's the beauty so of it. You get to play with it and, and you can put yeah. it back. So, you know. Exactly. I don't know. Why I'm being, I guess because, you know, it's mine. I'm like, I want, it, yeah, I want it to be done right, <laughs> but I'm the one working yeah. on it. I don't mind being so picky. Yeah. 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 It's good uh, practice for you, if nothing else. Yeah. Make sure you leave yourself yeah, a, a good review. <laughs> yes, <All right>. exactly. <laughs> Yeah, the Google review is going to be from the company account. Yeah, <laughs> we're going to do a review from our own selves. Yeah, but that That's piano, awesome. it did get, uh, the roof was leaking, and for about six hours, water was dripping into the keys. And so that's kind of how I got into the piano repairs, because, like, that happened. And I was like, oh, my gosh. So I took the whole thing apart, and I was like, you know, this wasn't that bad to take it apart. And then, uh, and I was like, you know, I should, I was like, I should try to get into this and then that's how i learned about the pta and then i kind of oh my that. gosh that's yeah. awesome victor but, yeah, yeah i did I, that's I, really cool yeah how many I, years I ago tried it out and i mean the bushing that was in 2000 that was in 2020 2020 oh 2021 yeah and every, thanks I mean, for sharing that victor that's awesome <laughs> it's so yeah. cool and, you know, I, I, I can think back to when I took it apart, and it's pretty much the same way now. I was like, wow, I guess I was pretty good for not knowing anything, <laughs> you know. So that was good. And uh, I put everything back together cause, correctly because, I mean, everything still works fine now. So that was good. But those key bushings got real cold, though, from all that water. The key bed got yep. real wet. I dried everything out, and everything, you know, it plays, it plays decent. But now, I'm, you know, I guess I can change them out to the way I want them, so. Yeah, I would have fun with it. Make it, and that's what I've done with this P twenty two. I've made it. This has been. What do they say? It's like a. It's a horse term. Rode hard and put up wet. This. That's this piano. It's. <laughs> it's been through the ringer. <laughs> it's been tuned so many times, huh? <laughs> it really has. Okay, so remember, on Wednesday we're going to be talking about. What are we going to be talking about? We're going to be talking um, stable. Stabilizing, making sure everything's good. We're going to be testing it out with this. And so I will see you on Wednesday. Thanks, David.